All right, let's all say thank you to Cindy for uh, helping us with worship. Um, Cindy has been sick for uh, two weeks now. Uh, it's been hard for her, especially with a baby, taking care of a baby, and then also trying to recover. Um, and uh, yeah, now Bodin, our other worship leader, is, is overseas now. And so uh, we have uh, Cindy, only Cindy. <laughs> but, uh, but she's doing great. And so thank you for, for doing, taking care of our worshiping, our, our music. Uh, being faithful. So, yeah, thank you. All right. Um, it says uh, Romans 15, 13. That's what we're going to read out loud today. But I would like you to open your Bible to the book of Psalms and open to Psalm 130. Psalm 130. Shihen uh, Hyaksanju. Yeah, so we'll spend much time in Psalm 130. And the other scripture is, is here. Um, so just while you're turning there, uh, about the gospel choir, uh, Miwa said that some members of the gospel choir become Christian through the gospel choir. And Jim said that uh, that's sometimes the only contact that many people have to the gospel through the music, and it's true. Uh, but please don't misunderstand. It does not mean if no one becomes Christian through the gospel choir, then it's meaningless. No, 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 no. Um, we, we reach out to the world through the gospel choir uh, with the gospel. Yes, that's true. But... Uh, even if no one becomes Christian through the gospel choir, it's still worth having the gospel choir because the world needs music, <laughs> right? God saves the world through beauty, beauty, goodness, and truth. Christmas is a wonderful chance to make the world beautiful through decorations, through music, and, and, and parties. That's a beautiful thing. So, uh, yeah, the gospel choir is more than just evangelism. It's worship and making God, and, and part of the gospel. So, yeah, amen, hallelujah. So, uh, all right, let's read together Romans chapter 15, verse 3. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So uh, the, the subject is increasing with good expectation. Uh, that's the title of the sermon. It's not a good title <laughs> because uh, I'm just trying to be clever and trying to say this, this phrase, overflow with hope. Now, and another way to say it is increase with good expectation. Hope is a good expectation. And overflow uh, means to increase. That's Christmas. So uh, church and Christian life is not guilt, shame, and obligation. The Christian life is faith, hope, and love. That's the Christian life. So you don't come to church so that I can tell you you're a sinner and you will go to hell if you don't become a Christian. That's not how you do church. You come to church because God loves you and you give your life to him through faith. And through that faith, you have hope. Now, Christmas is the four words of Advent. Um, faith, hope, joy, and love. And so, oh no, excuse me, not faith, peace. Peace, hope, joy, and love. We talked about peace the last few weeks. We'll talk about joy next week. No, no joy is on Christmas. Love is next week. This week is hope. Now, uh, something about hope. 
Um, here's the message. The this, this sermon has one point, okay? Everybody knows the rules. One point sermon, okay? Three parts, but one point, all right? Here's the point. Through Jesus Christ, God is filling the world with hope. So uh, my image of hell is if I go to a waiting room and you sit down, you know, in those hospital sofas and there's elevator music or there's other people and you're waiting. So maybe you're watching some TV that nobody's watching, you know, and there's some magazines that nobody reads and you're waiting and waiting. And then people call the name, somebody's name, and you see somebody get up and they go, right? And you say, oh, maybe I'm next. Ten minutes later, they call a different name, different person. Twenty minutes later, another person gets called. My image of hell is in a waiting room with no one calling your name forever and ever and ever. It's hopeless. That's right? You see, we need hope because life is hard. And if there's no purpose for the pain in my life, I don't want to live it. If there's no reason that I'm experiencing trouble and difficulty and suffering you know, illness and sickness and loneliness and darkness, if there's no light after this, if there's no life after all of this death, that's hopeless. We need hope. The world needs hope. And the good news is that through Jesus Christ, God is filling everything with light, love, laughter, and hope. So that's our destination for today. Here we are. Here's three things, three steps we'll get there. We'll talk about the difference of hope, the substance of hope, and finally, the overflow of hope. So uh, the difference is what, what is hope, the substance is what's the object of our hope, and then the overflow is how, how does hope work in our life. So uh, first is the difference. Now, uh, some of you think uh, hope is similar to, or no, maybe you don't think, but some of us mistake hope and optimism. Optimism is uh, dakkan, right? Dakkan, that's optimism. That's not hope, okay? Optimism is um, just kind of a wishful thinking. It's like you don't really know anything. You just hope that the situation will be good. And it's like a wish. It's very shallow, right? It's like a child uh, thinks that um, Santa will come uh, and, you know, there's no chimney and there's only one small door, but they're up there, they have optimism about something good will happen. And so that's not hope, okay? Optimism is not superstition. Excuse me, optimism is superstition. It's blind. Hope actually is looking at something. So um, in the Bible, hope is based on a person and not a situation. So when God gives people hope, what, what they do is they look back to what God did in the past. He set the people free in Egypt. He led them through the desert. He opened the promised land to them. And then people look back to that. He, he raised the, the sons of the widows. He, he defeated the enemies, the giants. He gave people power to fight wild animals and half humans and a, an army. He defeated armies without one single sword being taken out. And so the people of God look back at what God did, and they look forward to what he, 
he's going to do. So, for example, hope is looking back at the past, and that's a solid ground to stand on to look forward. I have hope that the sun will rise tomorrow because I look back at yesterday and the sun came up and the day before that and the week before and the month before, the sun keeps coming up. So even though it's dark and cold and lonely, because I know that the sun came up yesterday, I have hope that the sun will come up in just a few hours. I look back so that I can look forward. That's hope. That's different from optimism, right? So now, as it says there, in the Bible, hope is based on a person. So that person is God. For example, in Psalm 39, we have here, but now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. It's interesting because uh, I, the, you can see the, the two words that I highlighted. There's wait and there's hope. That's almost the same word. The word wait, matz, and the word hope, kibo, in the Bible are the same word, almost. Uh, one is, um, yeah, hope is translated wait, or wait is translated hope, and another word for hope is, well, it, it's rope, as you can see. The, the first picture in, in the, um, in the, slides. So why is that? The image for an ancient person in Israel, when you take a rope and you stretch it, and you're pulling, and you twist it, and you, what's happening is when you twist or when you stretch the rope, there is a tension. It's tight. And two things are possible. The first thing is it will break. Right? The second possibility is if you let go, it will come back like a rubber band. And so when you're pulling, it's this tension. You're expecting something to happen. There's this tension that something will return. And so that word kav or kava, hope, means anticipation, expectation, tension for something or someone to happen, to do something. And so uh, that's, that's what the substance of the hope is. So uh, hopefully you have your Bible open to Psalm 130. This is an amazing study. Uh, I spent most of my time this week studying this psalm in preparation for the sermon, so deep, so rich, so powerful. I can't, I, I could talk about this for two hours, but we'll do it in five minutes, okay? So the, the first verse, out of the depths, I cry to you, Lord. Oh, Lord, hear my cry for mercy. Hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. What's the image of this Psalmist, he is drowning. You see the word depths? So the water is coming up, and it's up to his chin. It's reaching his nose, and he's, he's falling in. There's nothing below him to put his feet, and the waters are going up over his head, and he's, out of the depths, I cry. Uh, the one time I felt like I almost died is when I was in high school, and I was learning how to surf. I grew up in Los Angeles, California. And the waves in Los Angeles, California are very violent. They're very steep. They come up and it's like a wall. And then they slam down. And then it's just a lot of white water. And so as a beginner surfer, I was learning how to ride these waves. And one morning, it was so violent, I had no business trying to learn as a beginner, but one wave just took me, slammed me down, and typically, after you go down under, one second, two seconds, <gasps> you come up. 
But the wave was so violent that it took me under. I was down and I'm, I'm rolling in, in the waves uh, under the water for, it felt like minutes, hours. And I'm waiting to, for the, to get up. I can't, I'm still rolling in the water. And I thought, oh, this is how I die. <laughs> 18 years old, just a beginner learning how to surf, and now I'm, this is the end. Okay, Lord, I'm done. But at that moment, finally, I was able to come up. Out of the depths, I cry. He's drowning. Why is he drowning? Why is he going under? Look at verse, uh, verse 3. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, he understands that he's drowning in life. It's a terrible situation because of sin, because of his disobedience to God. But not only his personal sin, but look, it says at the bottom, he, uh, verse 7, Israel, Put your hope in the Lord. Verse 8, he will redeem Israel from all their sins. It's not just his personal disobedience. It's his whole people, his country. Why? Here's one hint. It's Psalm 130. This is towards the end of the Psalms. This is a psalm that somebody wrote while they were in another country because God let Babylon conquer Israel. And the people of Israel were taken out into exile. And they had to live in tents as refugees. No plumbing, no walls, no roof. It's dirty. It's hot. It's stinky. And you're poor. There's no food. It's terrible. This is Psalm 130. And there's a reason for that. God has punished his people. He took them out. And they're in exile. And many of us know how that feels. It's dirty. It's dark. It stinks. We're not rested. We're not peaceful. We can't sleep. There's dogs everywhere. It's violent. It's dangerous. Out of the depths, I cry. And then the word hope comes out in here. And it's the two words I was telling you. The first word is wait. As you can see, wait is repeated again and again. And the word kav, kava, tension, expectation. Right? I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. I'm sitting here amongst the dogs and the flies and the stink, and I'm waiting for God. Now, what is he waiting for God? What happens if God comes? Four things. Mercy, forgiveness, unfailing love, redemption. If you think about it, all of us are waiting for mercy, forgiveness, unfailing love, redemption. That's, that's everybody's hope. That's everybody here, everybody in Hiroshima who's honest. They're waiting for forgiveness, mercy, love, and redemption. And then he says, there's only one person who can deliver what we truly need. And he says, it's the Lord himself. And he says, in his word, I put my hope. Here's the word. What, why does he put his hope in the word? Because he knows that God predicted and he promised this. God said in Deuteronomy, the first part of Deuteronomy, the last part of Deuteronomy, he said, Israel, if you will obey me, I'll give you life. If you will disobey I'll send you away. But listen, Israel, even if I send you away, it will not be forever. I'll send you away, 
but I will not throw you away. Understand this. God does not throw away. He sends away, but then he will bring back. That's what he promised. And so the, the, the writer of this psalm is saying, I'm putting my hope in that promise. Because if anybody can keep their promises, it's God. That's what he's saying. So, four things he's hoping for. Mercy, forgiveness. That's something we pray for every day. Forgive me of my sins as I forgive those who sin against me. How many times do I pray that? Every single day. And not just forgive us of our sins. Lord, forgive me of my sins as I forgive those who sin against me. Mercy and forgiveness. And then here's the best part. Unfailing love and redemption. Unfailing love. There's a love that I cannot give to Naomi. I'm human. I can only give so much. And there's a, there's a kind of love that my wife, she cannot give me. She works so hard because of her love for me and our children. But even that, we are not satisfied. There's only one who can give love that will never fail. And then here's, oh, here's the good one. Redemption. What is redemption? Right, Kaiho. A few weeks ago, somebody asked me, one of my students, they said, uh, Habakon Sensei, I have a question. Uh, if a person becomes a Christian, you, you said that God will change the person. Ooh. What, what's the word? Substance. Ah, <laughs> it's okay. All right. <laughs> I, was thought, I thought you were looking up redemption, so I, I hope I got that right. But anyways, so I, I always say you have to go through death to get the eternal life. That's, that's the Christian life, right? Jesus says, deny yourself daily, pick up your cross, follow me through death into life. And so that student listens to me in my Bible class, and he said, Habakkuk Sensei, uh, so I have to die to get new life. Okay, but Habakkuk says, if I die, uh, so I, I have a new, new life. It's a new me. And I say, yes. And everybody who understands the gospel, they say, yes, amen. You have to die to yourself, die to your flesh, die in the death of baptism to walk in new life, right? Yes and amen. But this student had a very interesting question. He saw it as a negative. Because he thought, if I die, does it mean my identity, my essence, who I am as a human being, does God throw me away? If I become a new person, what happens to the old person? Does he forget everything? Does everything just become nothing? So when I die, do I just, like the Buddhist or the Shinto thought, I'm, I'm like a drop in the ocean, and the person who I am becomes nothing? And so what's the answer? What's the answer? I said, you know, when Jesus was resurrected and he met his disciples, they didn't believe him. They thought he was a ghost. And so he said, look at my hands. Touch them. Look at the holes. He said, look at my side. Put your hand here. I'm not a ghost. And I said, why are the holes and why is the wound still in his body, even though he resurrected? Why? It's because God is teaching us the wounds from the past, the wounds from the old life, the darkness and the pain, the regret, God is able to not only heal, God is not only able to renew, God is able to use all of that negative darkness and evil to make the future even brighter. 
the more difficult the struggle, the greater the glory on the other side. That's called redemption. He does not throw away your mistakes, your regrets, your, your, your faults, your wounds, and your pain. He uses it to make you even more beautiful, more, God, more glorious. And so you have to think of your, your purpose in life. What did God make you to do? It's there inside. But until that dies, you'll never understand or realize that full purpose of potential. So you think of a seed like an acorn, OK? And an acorn, the purpose of the acorn is not to stay an acorn. The purpose of an acorn is to become an oak tree, a big, beautiful, marvelous, strong, powerful, unshakable, long-lasting, long-living tree. But that acorn must die. It must go into the ground in order for it to fulfill its purpose. That's the message of the gospel. That's called redemption, OK? So that's redemption, Kaiho. I think it's Kaiho. OK, yeah. Aganai. OK, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kaiho is different. Maybe, uh, um, I don't know. OK, so, so Aganai is redemption, where God uses all of those past pains and, and hurts to make the glory brighter and more beautiful. So that's in God. That's what this psalmist believes. That's our hope. <laughs> that's the substance of our hope. Now, uh, so Luke chapter 3, Jesus is going to uh, meet his cousin in the Jordan River. And in the Jordan River, it's not just Jesus and his cousin John. It's a lot of people. They are drowning in the depths. But they are waiting on God. And so here's it is. Here's the thing. The difference between optimism and hope, here it is. Optimism is passive. It just waits. It does nothing. Just, uh, I hope it's good. Hope in the Bible is waiting act passively, but also acting, doing something. Not just waiting for the good thing to happen, but actively singing, actively praying, actively working so that that hope will come. And so the people are going to John the Baptist in Luke chapter 3. They're going to repent of their sin, to give their life to God. And they're hoping that maybe John is the Messiah who will lead them into the new life, in the new kingdom of God, right? Free from Romans, free from sin, free from the demons, that John, you will help save us. And John says, nope, it's not me. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. And John answered, no, 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 no. I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. You are waiting for God, the Holy Spirit, to come into your life. I'm not the one who will be your power. You're waiting for God to be your power. And so now Jesus comes. And he, said, he gets into the water, and he says, John, baptize me. John says, no, 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 no. You should baptize me, Jesus. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. I want everybody to see that I'm going into death and coming out into new life. And if they follow me into the waters of death, they'll come out. And so he says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, 
heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him bodily in the form of a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you I'm well pleased. Now, do you see the substance of the hope? The people are waiting for God. Jesus comes and God says, this is who you're waiting for. The one you're waiting for, for mercy, love, forgiveness, and redemption, it's in him. And why is it necessary for the Holy Spirit to be there? Without the Holy Spirit, there's no overflow. Jesus, after he rose from the dead, Mary, his disciple, grabbed him by the leg, the arm. I don't know. She's grabbing him. And he says, Mary, if you hold on to me now, you'll never have me for eternity. You have to let go. I have to ascend in order for the Holy Spirit to come into you. That's why he came. And so the Holy Spirit came to descend and fill his people. Just like the Holy Spirit filled Jesus, the Holy Spirit fills his followers, his disciples. And now we overflow. I love the Japanese word, juitsu. It's the word uh, abundance. And then the word Jews, Jude no Jew, right? It's, you're being charged like a battery. And then you're overflowing with what? Hope. Hope. And that's how God fills the world with hope. So I just want to give you some stories. Uh, my mentor, Dr. Rich Freeman, Ocean View Baptist Church, it's him here in the blue. He retired from being a pastor early so that he can help other pastors. He loves turkey, not the Thanksgiving American turkey food. No, no, no. He loves the country of turkey, <laughs> okay, Turco, because that's where the first churches were, okay? And when he went to Turkey to visit the archaeological sites, he met pastors and Christians and churches and they really impacted him. And he wanted to do everything he could to help them. So he retired from the work of a full-time pastor so that he can then raise money to give to the churches in Turkey. Raise support to give to the pastors of those churches. And I'm part of that support. And so he sends me that report. And uh, this is what I got in my inbox this morning. And it's just him. He's introducing. This is one pastor. This is Pastor Magdi. Um, he's serving hopeless among Arabic-speaking refugees, maybe Syrians from the Syrian war. They're coming into Turkey. And this Pastor Magdi is helping to give those people hope. And then, um, so here's Turkey. He has other pastors. Pastor Armanji. Maybe it's too small, so I'll read it for you. Pastor Armanji. His church just baptized seven new believers. Or, no, no, sorry, 17 new believers. And he is mentoring a second pastor for expanding ministry. Pastor Gurkan, along with his church in Istanbul, Istanbul, Gurkan is helping with new churches for Turkish communities in countries of Azerbaijan and Georgia. It's spreading to other countries. Pastor Kem, or Sem, I don't know how to read this, is serving vibrant church, serving a vibrant church while trying to find a permanent meeting place. His rent has gone up drastically, and he struggles with the cost of a family of five. Pastor Ertan, this dear pastor is also leading a growing church with Turkish and Iranian families while training three of his leaders to start new churches today. So he's partnering with Iran, other Iranian churches. Christians are growing in Iran. And now he's partnering to, for three of those churches. 
Pastor Levant, he's planting a new church in a nearby Mediterranean city, still leading his existing church. So he's doing double the work. Uh, this is the last one, and it comes close to me because it's a f his family. Pastor Antoine, along with his pastoral responsibilities, Antoine is developing Christian camping programs for children in Turkey. Please pray for Christian children to grow up strong in their faith. Please pray for Antoine and his family as the government is threatening their family. I did not write in, I did not put it in the slides, but um, he says that the government is always watching and monitoring the Christians. Some of them they feel are threats to the peace of Turkey. It's religious. And even families are being threatened and they're raising the rent of some pastors. And so um, Dr. Freeman is trying to raise support and money for that. Why? Hope. There's suffering people in Turkey, refugees from Syria, people from Iran, Azerbaijan, Georgia. And the places, now here it is, the places where it's most difficult and most dark and most uh, oppressive, that's where the Christians are the strongest. Yeah. Where it's, where it's easy to be a Christian, that's where the churches are weak. Turkey, China, Latin America, India, the church is growing, strong. Hope is spreading around the world. People are receiving mercy, forgiveness, love, redemption. God is making the world new. He's filling the world with hope. So we come to Christ, we come to Jesus. He fills us with the Holy Spirit and love overflows. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow. Um, this week, when you're with somebody and you give them a reason to laugh, you give them a reason to enjoy their life, um, you give them a reason to look forward to tomorrow. If you can do that, you're overflowing with hope. How do you do that? You let Jesus Christ fill you with hope. You come to Jesus Christ, the source, the fountain of life. And the harder it is for you, the greater the glory will be. So some of you, you need to fight. Because I know, sometimes you give up the hope. <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you just don't care. You have no more strength. And it's cold and dark. And it's Monday. You can't give up. You have the Holy Spirit. He will not let you give up. He will fill you up. And then through your conversation, through the gifts that you give, um, through your presence of just sitting with people and talking with them, the way that you do your job that makes people look forward to being with you, you're spreading the gospel. You're spreading the hope. You're making the world a beautiful place. That's the overflow of hope. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, please fill us with your Holy Spirit that as we are filled, we would have the fruit of hope that will spread within us and then through us and out to this city. Make this city uh, a city of hope, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.